Welcome. I am Michelle LeClaire, Executive Director of Buckham Gallery. Today I am chatting with Emily Ledletner, whose exhibition Horizons is on view through January 8th. Horizons includes two bodies of work in tandem. One, a series of portraits documenting self-empathy, the other of objects in abundance addressing contradictory emotion and confusion. Both series consider moments of great transition and are associated complex emotional responses. Additionally, her work may be viewed online and on our website at buckhamgallery.org. Before we join the conversation, I would like to say thank you to our incredible audience, whether visiting the gallery in person or viewing these videos online, and to all the artists who submit to our exhibition calls. I appreciate you. Next, I would like to say a big thank you to all the individuals and organizations who support Buckham Fine Arts Project and Gallery, including the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, and the National Endowment for the Arts, the Greater Flint Count Arts Council Share Art Genesee Grant Program, made possible by the Genesee County Arts Education and Cultural Enrichment Village Fund. Thank you. Today, I am chatting with Emily Legletner, whose exhibition Horizons is on view through January 8th. Additionally, her work may be viewed on our website at buckhamgallery.org. Like Lettner, an MFA candidate in printmaking at the University of Alberta creates printed work informed by lens-based inquiry, performance, and the body. Using portraiture to share autobiographical narratives and self-reflections in her exhibition, Horizons. Welcome, Emily. Hi, Michelle. Thanks so for having me. <laughs> yeah, I'm so happy to have you here today. Um, so this is just a beautiful body of work and exhibition. Um, and of course, I love printmaking and all of your imagery and color and patterns. And I'm really looking forward to learning more about it here today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So and this is additionally fun because you are one of Buckham's artist collaborators and now we have an opportunity to learn more about you. Um, and so I would like to start our conversation with some background information. Where are you from and what led you down a path to art making? Yeah, yeah. So I'm um, I'm from Flint. I've lived in Flint since, uh, I don't know, I was like maybe three or four um, in a long time. Um, so I probably started art making actually at the Flint Institute of Arts. I was taking classes there since I was a little kid. Um, and I always knew I was going to go into art. Um, I discovered printmaking actually in this kind of uh, unlikely way. I was at the University of Michigan Flint before they started their print program. And I was in an art appreciation course with uh, Mike Sevick and he just mentioned we were having a section about printmaking and um, I always did pen and ink drawing. So like visually print printmaking was kind of speaking to me because it had a lot of that kind of rock catching, very graphic black and white um, work. And so after class, I went up uh, to him and, and just wanted to know more. And he had a bunch of speedball products in his in his office studio that he wasn't using. And he kind of just like sent me off with a box of linoleum <laughs> and carving tools and was like, go make a print. And I was like, okay, I don't know, even know what that is, but like, let's give it a shot. Um, and then that was it. I was like totally hooked on printmaking. Um, and then if, like two years later, U of M Flint um, got a big donation of litho stones and presses and uh, Rebecca Zeiss kind of started the, um, printmaking program there. And we had a lot of uh, trial and errors for a couple of years together, learning how to do a lot of new things together. Um, but really that's a beautiful way to learn print because it is so, um, it's very technical, but it's also very fluid. So if you kind of just keep working through all the issues, you get there. Um, and then I transferred to the University of Michigan Ann Arbor um, to work with Andy Koskovic, who was a world-renowned printmaker. Um, I saw his work online and just realized I really needed to transfer and get the chance to study with him. Um, and then I was really fortunate that he had just come back from a 
uh, Fulbright in Poland, where he was doing a lot of laser engraving for the first time, and he was looking for a studio assistant to jump on board with that. Um, and then we worked together for five years. Um, and that was really a way to just in depth start to work in woodcut um, beyond what I could have done in the classroom. Uh, because he's a really ambitious artist making massive works and there's nothing like just being thrown in to having to work on that caliber. Um, so I did and now I, I also make massive woodcuts. Um, <laughs> So that's, that's really where I ended up with it. Um, and now I'm, I'm like, a, like you mentioned, I'm at the University of Alberta uh, trying to concentrate in it with a master's degree. So it's quite, yeah. the bug caught me. <laughs> that's so exciting. And what a wonderful way to, to, um, to learn a process and really dive into it. Yeah, well, thank you yeah. for sharing that. Um, so the title for this exhibition is Horizons. And in your statement, you mentioned that Horizons features two bodies of work. Um, you know, one is a series of portraits documenting self-empathy, the other objects of abundance addressing contradictory emotion and confusion. Um, can you share a little bit more about the two bodies and why you chose to, you know, pair them together? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the title is derived from um, what was my undergraduate thesis and several of the works in the show at Buckham Now um, are from that, that work. Um, and that show is titled, You Can See It on the Horizon Now. Um, and so that body of work was really dealing with um, really complex emotional experiences around um, aging into adulthood, dealing with um, emotionally abusive relationships um, and kind of the feelings uh, of self-compassion and self-destruction that kind of come with those, um, those moments of, of time in life. Um, so the title you can see on the horizon now was really supposed to be positive. Like, like here's kind of these things that I'm struggling with, but there's like, you can see the outcome. You can see the, the, the horizon line and that there's kind of something hopeful to work towards. Um, and then I decided to just kind of pare that down into a single statement word, because I think the word horizons can be really powerful and really open to interpretation, um, and paired it with new work, which is um, kind of work that was this transition period between the two bodies, this work I was doing during the pandemic, um, which again, I think we all needed that kind of little light of hope. Um, and then the work I'm doing now, uh, which is a large part of the exhibition um, are the works that I just started in my master's thesis, uh, which are also dealing with this idea of contradictory feeling. So that body of work is based in um, based around images of home, uh, labor, and aspirations. And I'm kind of trying to work through, um, like I said, the contradictory feelings of those. So like home is a space of comfort and confinement, uh, which I think we all experienced during the pandemic. Um, labor as kind of uh, motivation, but also distractions. So like, you know, working uh, 40, 60 hours a week for 40 years and then uh, retiring and realizing you don't have the same energy or time, et cetera, uh, that you thought you would working towards that. I'm kind of experiencing that watching my parents retire and seeing what that means for them. And then aspirations as also a exciting motivator, but also those feelings of disappointment when you don't achieve things in your life that you expected to um, or hope to. So, um, so I just decided the two bodies of work, even though they're, they're one's very specific personal narratives and the other is, is this more broad, um, they're both dealing with these conflicting emotions around uh, kind of very specific things that we all experience. So, um, and then the title Horizons, as I mentioned, is kind of the positive of that. Like, it's okay to have these very conflicting feelings. There's always kind of something on the other side, right? Um, so I think it's a good kind of general title. Um, the new body of work is called Dreams Beyond Reason. Um, so at some point there'll be, um, I have some exhibitions coming up where the title will change a little bit. But I think the two works uh, work in tandem really well together, so. They do, and we, I will be bringing up some of those slides of your newer pieces, I have those, um, so we can talk about them also. 
um, yeah, thank you. Uh, that yeah. they do work exceptionally well together. I was just thinking. <laughs> yeah. It's so weird to be um, in this moment of transition where like I have a finished body work and like an incomplete and like how do you just bridge bridge them? So that's what this exhibition is doing. <laughs> And it does, it does. So, so this would be from the first body of work, correct? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this is, this is well, you can see it behind me <laughs> at a distance, it's, it's quite large. And so can you actually tell me a little bit about your process for this? Because I mean, sure. seven plates of 14 colors, that's hugely ambitious for yeah. <laughs> woodcut print, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know why I like to torture myself. I'm sure that most of these images could be done uh, in much more simpler ways, but that's not what I do. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it is quite large. Um, I definitely feel like I've grown a lot as a printmaker since this piece. Um, if I were to reprint it now, I probably could get it down to four plates, but you know, we're always learning. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Um, but I actually recently reprinted this work. In fact, the work that's at Buckham um, was printed this year. So it was interesting to revisit those plates two years later and think through how, how I'm working through woodcut. Um, so for anyone who kind of doesn't know the process of woodcut, I essentially make giant stamps. Um, so I carve into wood blocks the parts that I don't want to print. So essentially the white. Um, and then I roll it up with ink, run it through a press, or actually this is hand printed with, uh, with a baron or a wooden spoon, uh, which is quite labor intensive, you can imagine at that scale. Um, and so this one is seven plates, so I find a way to uh, register or line up those seven plates and to like basically summarize it in, a, in short, each plate is a separate color or each plate is a few separate colors. Um, that then kind of just all build up like a coloring book um, with, with, with line work at the end to bring it all together. Um, yeah, so these are all laser engraved and then hand carved. So it's really important for me to kind of dance between that digital and analog realm. And part of that is that I work, um, I start working with, uh, with photographs. So all of these are, I have a camera set up with a clicker and I kind of perform in front of the camera um, all these uh, kind of moments that I want to capture. And then I bring them into Photoshop and find ways to collage, um, especially when I was working with the two figures, which a lot of works are, um, collage those together. Um, and then I laser engrave it, which is essentially just um, a printer. It prints it by engraving into the wood. Um, and I really love that process because it can get so many textures into the wood that you can't with hand carving. Um, so I think it has a lot of value in that, but it's certainly no shortcut. I spend um, 60 to 100 hours making the drawing, which then gets translated to the engraver. Um, and then maybe another 60 to 100 hours uh, hand carving back into the laser texture um, and then printing. And I never, these are so massive. Um, I never print more than maybe four or five of an image, um, which really seems absurd for how much time goes into uh, the plates. But I always have the plates on hand. So like they're not going anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. But I really, they, they take at least a full day to pull one, one panel, right? And this is three panels. Um, so every time I print another one, I always like, oh, I'm going to change this color a little bit. Or like I should make this adjustment here because it's such... A, a huge commitment to print them. Um, so I don't audition. They're always unique impressions. Um, they're always just slightly unique. Um, yeah, so that's, that's essentially, I mostly do hand, hand printing uh, in my home studio. I'm having to kind of relearn printing with the press now that I'm in my grad program. Oh, <laughs> um, oh I was gonna ask something. Well, I mean, hand printing is, is extremely intensive. I mean, physically, yeah. <laughs> even small ones. So I, I could imagine um, only uh, keeping a, a few, printing a few at a time. Um, so would you consider them in ways, since you adjust the colors, you know, from one print to the other is more of like a mono print then, or is it? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're uh, 
I think the kind of whatever printmaking official term, which everyone does it different, is unique impressions. So they're usually marked mm -hmm. UI. Um, I do a lot of monotype printing too. Um, I usually do that before I develop color plates, just because once I've carved a key plate, um, I kind of want to have a sense of what I'm going to do with the color plates before I start carving them. Um, so monotype usually is done with plexiglass and you kind of paint or draw directly on the plexiglass and then run that through the press. Um, so a few, the image of the laundry, laundry pile that's in the bucket exhibition. That, yeah, so this is a monotype. So this is definitely like not only a unique impression, but there won't be any other one like it, even kind of similarly. Um, so this one, I have uh, oil, oil paints where I've painted on plexiglass all the little different colors. You can see there's a lot of blends. Um, and that's printed on one giant piece of plexiglass run through the press. And then the uh, black line is the hand carved woodcut that's then pressed over top of that. Um, so a lot of my works are that kind of unique impression just to get a sense of, of what I might want to do with the color plates. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm actually working on carving color plates for this piece now. So, so this piece is uh, 2020. So like it takes a few years to start to develop the, the woodcut plates afterwards. So at some point soon, this will be additioned, uh, additioned which will still be a bunch <laughs> of unique impressions. Right. <laughs> Oh, I love hearing about that process. I, you know, I didn't realize you were doing, uh, actually painting on um, plexiglass. I yeah. thinking about before, but that's, that's fascinating. Wow. I had such wow. a resistance to painting as a medium for the longest time. So funny that I found a way to bring it into printmaking. And now I'm like, oh, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, painting on plexiglass is awesome. <laughs> Oh, oh, so very cool. I was curious as to how you were getting some of those variations um, in the, the tone and tint um, in, in the print. Yeah. 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 And the, the highlights are just the parts of the plate that don't receive paint on them, which is kind of weird to think about when you're doing it. But um, yeah, so it's just mm -hmm. a bunch of blends on a big, big sheet of plexiglass. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> here um, so yeah, newer all the lines and the patterns here and really the space that is developed i'm curious about the images and the pairing of of the two and just I'm just overwhelmed really with with the scale of these and um so would you talk to us a little bit about these yeah yeah um, so I can kind of talk about two things, the conceptual and the uh, kind of process that led to them. I'll start with the process. Um, so this, this is part of the new work. And um, I was really, for a while, I was working with uh, literal like shapes of piles. You'll see a few works in the show that have these pile shapes. Um, but then I still consider this work kind of part of those uh, piles of things because I started to want to work with this um, basically re repetition of an object or repetition of a simple form. Um, so the first work here with these three prints um, is the I will nestle myself within your hunger for the ground, the one with this kind of weird rope object. Um, and that really just started with like, I'm going to make this really overwhelming um, pattern of grass. So the image started with just the background. Um, and that was also really fun for me because I drew, I drew it um, like white on black. So I was really actually working in the negative. Um, and just as, a, as an artist, that was a new way for me to kind of make my brain wrap around things, right? Um, like I hadn't done that since maybe Matt Osmond's class at the FIA when I was like 13. So it was good to like force myself back to my old drawing skill. Um, and I think it was super effective. So that's part of the reason why like up close, it's really hard to look at. Um, but if you like kind of back up, uh, it kind of becomes a whole image. Um, and then I wanted to return, so then working with these piles. So then I was working with this rope and I do photograph myself. So I was out in the yard with my tripod kind of looking down. Um, 
rolling around with uh, with a hose. It's a garden hose. That's what uh, that's what it is. Um, and then just kind of capturing. That's how a lot of my images come about. I'm just like playing in front of the camera, um, and then I catch a moment of like, oh, that looks that looks interesting. Like, what's going on there? Um, and then I hand draw it. So from that reference, I hand draw it. Um, yeah. So then when I started so I really loved that texture that that patterning um so I decided to bring the actual digital file into this image of the fences um and that's part of the reason I really love working digitally and analog is that I can I always have these resources to borrow from um that I've kind of developed over you know so many years of working so just pulling that file over and then uh, drawing this fences image. And now I'll talk a little bit more about the concept because I think the fences um, is really where that kind of started to head. So uh, I, the work that I was trying to develop uh, in my master's thesis is thinking about uh, the hist my family's history of labor. So my family um, are all from Flint. Uh, this specifically is my uh, paternal side of the family who immigrated from Germany to Flint uh, to work on the auto, auto automotive assembly lines um, when my grandma was three. So we're, I'm only two generations out from, uh, from Germany. And uh, so my great grandfather, Max, um, brought his family here for, for you know, uh, better opportunities. And I started to really think about what was motivating him. So he uh, tended to, um, a lilac, like he had lilac bushes and a rose garden um, in this house in Flint, uh, which is now actually photos of it's all now all boarded up, you know, um, because Flint has gone through a lot of things. Um, but he tended this garden. So after he would leave his shift at the GM plant and then walk several miles um, back towards downtown, um, then he would tend to this garden. And then he grew a lot of vegetables. They did a lot of canning. Like he was very um, involved with his garden, right? So this was clearly kind of um, a leisure activity for him. And so I started to think through how working, like doing that really hard labor work was motivating him to care for his family, develop this, this home for them. Um, and so the, the fences is kind of this, you know, iconic white picket fence American dream uh, image. Um, so I wanted to bring that iconic object into this work uh, in combination with these really beautiful, um, over kind of overly perfect, the way that I drew them, um, floral uh, designs, and then make this kind of very um, disturbing space. That's what kind of ended up developing when I started to make this space so like when you see the the work in person uh you kind of have this sense of like i don't know if i want to walk back into that labyrinth i don't know if i want to head yeah. into that space um but clearly someone does because there's a hammer and one of the fences is broken so like you get the sense that someone does live here someone tends to the space but i'm not sure i personally feel comfortable going there and that gets into my desire to make images that have contradictory feelings. So this like beautiful, perfect garden in a space that I'm not sure is safe, right? Or maybe it feels a little threatening. Um, and that still kind of relates to my feelings about labor, about home, um, that it can have kind of two sides, right? So this, this work started from a very positive story, very beautiful story about my family. But as I started to develop it, I realized that uh, visually it was kind of going in another direction. And I'm super happy for the, to have those kind of just odd things start to happen and leave it open to the interpretation of my viewers. Is this positive? Is this negative? You know, um, I want that back and forth. Yeah, and same with the rope, the, the rope image. Uh, I actually imagine that it's playful because I was playing around with a garden hose in my backyard, but I don't think it always necessarily reads yeah. as playful. So I think that's fun. That dichotomy is really an interesting space to be in. <laughs> yeah, and uh, back to the the garden. You know, it does. You know, sitting in front of you feel the space. You know, that moving back, but it's not inviting at all. You know, with all these yeah. barriers. You know, yes, you can to see a path to get through, but it's not. 
inviting you to come <laughs> in. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's not always uh, intentional for me that it heads that way, but as I'm mm. working through an image, I mean, I'm also letting the image do what it wants to do, right? So like, if, if this is visually working, I'm okay if it didn't necessarily uh, end up with the same concept that I started with. Um, because I do think there's an intuitiveness to art making and I'm happy to just kind of let that happen. Um, so I don't know why this image turned out more disturbing than not, but intuitively it did. And I, you know, and it's really powerful. People stand in front of it for a long time, kind of absorbing what's going on. So if I'm, if my work is doing that, I'm, I'm not going to keep fussing with it. It's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of them, of the images, have a beauty, uh, but also a, that disturbing side to it. You know, whether it's yeah. from the the portraits or uh, the other works. Um, let's see. All right. So this is another one of the newer works that you were doing yes. in school, right? Yeah. yeah. So you were talking about these like piles of things and sort of this overwhelming. So can you um, maybe talk about the direction that you were moving in with this print? Yeah, yeah. So this is actually just before school, but it's but I'm I'm roping it into the same um, body work. It'll probably show in my thesis just because this is so much the origins of what mm -hmm. I'm trying to work on now. Um, so this is actually kind of a pandemic image. It's kind of a memento mori image. Um, I developed it right after uh, my grandmother passed away, which was in January before the pandemic. We're actually. We actually suspect that COVID may have contributed to her death, but um, but we didn't know, right? We didn't we didn't know what was going on in the world. So, um, so when that was happening, uh, you know, we started to dismantle her house, um, which was a very odd experience for me because um, my grandma's house was always like my refuge growing up, right? So it was weird for me to realize I'm not going to step foot in this space anymore, right? Um, so nothing in this image is directly derived from her house other than she did have a striped blue wallpaper. It looks nothing like this, but I was thinking through um, this wallpaper. And um, at the same time, I was helping my parents who were retiring. Um, we were working on also doing some renovations to their house. So I spent a long time with my partner and I were like tearing wallpaper down from from one of the bedrooms um and so there was this kind of weird experience of transition that i was ha that I was having um and then the daisies you know there's kind of always that that little phrase of like pushing daisies kind of um you know it's a death phrase um so it's kind of thinking through that but also um how beautiful flowers are in abundance right so um so this is kind of a, a an image of it's it's very still and very um, kind of odd in this in this domestic space that's really kind of unclear. Um, at the same time, there are beautiful organic objects um, that are clearly thriving, right? You're, it's not a memento Marie image as in like rotting fruit. Like these are living uh, healthy daisies. Um, yeah, so this was just another one of those kind of weird contradictory images, uh, but I started to get really obsessed with this form of the pile. And so that is contributing to a lot of my work now. I may be moving a little away from the actual form of a pile, but um, this is really what started with this idea of like what objects in abundance do. So they're both um, beautiful, but also a little threatening in there being so many of them, right? Um, this one does it a little less, but there's, um, I think one of the images that you're going to show next has the oranges yeah. taking over the boat. Yeah, we can jump to that. Um, and so this gets into the pile being a little more threatening. So these are like uh, a fruitful, uh, you know, kind of nurturing object of the orange, right? Um, high, high in vitamins and all that good stuff, but they're um, consuming uh, this boat object. So now I'm starting to think through how do objects uh, both have, you know, like abundance as in like success, like it's a good thing. There's, we have a lot of it. And then there's also like, we have a lot of it. So now how do we deal with that abundance, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I was going through a lot of this, like helping my folks pack up their house in Flint, you know, where we've lived since I was five. Um, 
that's like 20 plus years of stuff, right? So there's this idea of like abundance as in we've been very fortunate, also abundance as in we have to deal with all this stuff. Um, so I was thinking through all these kind of complex ideas as I was developing all these pile images. Um, yeah, so we can talk about the boat image. I don't know if you had questions about that, but we're here now. No, I was just gonna say, um, talking about like dealing with um, the transitions in life and helping your, you know, your parents and stuff with these objects. I myself have become sort of the um, receptacle of family heirlooms from several generations. And it's like, I don't even know, <laughs> I kind of know small stories about parts, some of them, but it's like, what do you do with all of these things? Yeah, objects <laughs> that meant something yeah. to someone and like do yeah. mean something to you because they're from your family. Mm -hmm. But um, there's this distance that starts to develop and uh, you have to figure out what you do with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, even things like furniture. <laughs> I yes. inherited my uh, grandmother's piano. Um, that was a wedding gift to her from my grandfather, which is like such a beautiful story. And she played piano and I do not, but I couldn't ah. like, let it go somewhere else when my mom died. Because my mom, of course, had collected everything before me. And then, um, you know, when she oh. retired and was, you know, moving um, yeah. her home. Yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping someone's going to play piano in my family. Yeah. I also have several inherited pianos, so I, I really <laughs> Really? Um, wow. Yeah, I have a family of musicians, which is wonderful, but also, yeah, mm -hmm. at some point, and I played piano for eight years, but I don't now, so now it's like... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but it, it is a special object, so it's hard. It is, it is, and we, you know, we've moved with it. We take it with us. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's exactly what. Uh, that's exactly what a lot of these images that I'm working on now are. I'm working on one with uh, lamps, with a bunch of lamps, because that's another thing that I kept kind of. They're all antique, right? Like they're like 80 year old lamps or whatever. And we just kind of ended up and they're so different. Um, but again, it's an object that you're just moving around every time you move. Um, a bunch of my lamps are sitting on my piano. So I, <laughs> so it made me think of that. Like that's, that's what my piano is functioning as right now. Like a lamp stand. Yeah. <laughs> I love old funky lamps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you'll, awesome. you'll like the new, the new print then because it's just going to be a bunch of that. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Um, okay, so then tell me about the boat image since you yeah. referenced that. Yeah, so this really gets into, um, this was the first image I was developing with my new thesis. And of course, over the course of several months, things really shifted to the fences and the rope image. Um, but this was where I was first kind of starting and I was thinking through labor and aspirations. Um, so this boat is my dad's, um, it's called Viva. Um, and we have cared for it down in Florida for as long as I've been alive, um, they've had this boat, but I've never sailed on it. So um, my dad has been working, uh, he just retired last year at 75. So, um, you know, I'm kind of facing the reality that there was a lot of promises made around like places we would sail, places we would go on this boat. Um, but physically, I don't know that he's going to be able to do that anymore, right? Um, we're still talking about it. We still um, are talking about fixing up the boat. Uh, but it, it became this object of, of dreams for me, this object of like places I could go. I really want to see the, the iconic green flash on the water and not having like been able to experience that. Um, so I started to develop this image around like, it's my dad's dream, but it also became mine kind of because of him talking about it for so many years of my life. Um, and then the oranges uh, actually on my mother's side of the family who um, were actually kind of part of the pilgrims that came over to the U.S. So we have a really long history in the U.S. on that side of the family. Uh, some of them migrated down to Florida to, um, to farm oranges and make marmalade. Um, so I was kind of interested in this um, object of labor that's part of my family history 
And a lot of orange farming doesn't happen in Florida anymore, right? So over the course of the last hundred years, like the, the industry there and the landscape has changed a lot. So it's almost not as much part of Florida's um, uh, identity as much as it used to be, right? So I was also thinking through this kind of moment that my, my family was part of a transition within that state, right? Um, as part of their labor. So this image is about that. This is about that transition state of an idea that you have of a place or an idea that you have of an experience and how it kind of changes over the course of a lifetime, right? Um, yeah, so, so this is a, and, and I like this image because there's an oddity to the boat should be in the water, but it's not. Um, and how did these oranges end up there? Why are they taking over the boat? Um, obviously the boat can't move if, the, if it's consumed by this uh, fruit of abundance, right? Um, so lots, again, lots of contradictory feelings happening in one image. Yeah, and that beautiful, it's a blue, I don't know if it's a scarf or part of the sail or something, but that right there on the mast. Um, Oh yeah, yeah, that's the um, tarp that gets wrapped around the, the, the sail. Um, but yeah, it does have like a presence. Um, and that was actually just like as an artist, visually speaking, I really wanted, this image started with, I want to do an image that has orange and deep blue because those two colors can be so beautiful together. Um, so that kind of comes through in that little moment in the center. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you. So what are the major influences on your work? I know you mentioned the studio system ship. Um, yes. So that, of course, but what other influences, you know, and they could be positive or negative, you know, that are affecting you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I'll definitely, uh, you know, shout out to my mentor again, because I have to say that Andy Popovic is a massive influence on my work. Um, he, how could he not be, right, if I spent this many years uh, working for him. And one thing I really appreciated that he taught me was this idea of kind of legacy um, of people that, that you learn from and skills passed down over generations. So he's, he's from Bosnia and he worked with uh, an artist in his, I believe, undergrad, Hozo, who worked with, um, I think, a lot of etching, right? So for a long time, my professor's work was uh, these really complex, very highly textured kind of dark etchings. Um, and then he came to the US, he worked with Harvey Breverman, who was a painter in uh, Buffalo, New York. Um, and he worked with a lot of um, uh, figures, figure drawings, um, which actually my professor Andy Popovic doesn't do as much. Um, but so we've talked a lot about um, learning from someone, but being very purposeful to break away from what they were doing. Um, and so that's something I'm thinking about all the time, right? Because then I worked with Andy Popovic for five years. And of course, there's a lot of influence in my woodcuts that you can see um, that are also in his woodcuts, right? Um, but then being very conscious to develop a body of work that is di distinctly different. Um, so learning to kind of take those skills and those moments and make them your own. Um, and so that's something that I'm always thinking about and I'm really influenced by, uh, but then also this idea of um, commitment and labor uh, within the studio, which maybe is partly what is influencing my thesis is this idea that, um, especially with woodcut, in so many ways it's mundane. It's these repetitive mark making on these massive plates and, you know, um, really labor intensive, but there's a motivator of coming into the studio every day and having that commitment to the practice. And so I really got that from, from him. Um, so in terms of like influence as in how I stay motivated to keep making this work, like I have to, I have to attribute that to any possible. Um, visually, a lot of my work is inspired by um, Japanese mokuhanga prints. Um, so those are water-based woodcuts. Um, and that's Partly because of Andy Popovic, because we uh, he started teaching Mokuhanga uh, to my undergraduate classes while I was in Ann Arbor, um, but also just the site like uh, visually a lot of the works are these really fine black and white lines with really um, beautiful delicate um, 
color work with with a lot of blends and like highly complex color um which when you're working on smaller water-based prints is maybe a little more straightforward uh to work through than these big oil-based works but um part of the work that i was doing with with uh, my mentor was how do we kind of take those um, beautiful moments in Japanese woodcuts and how do we translate them into Western oil-based work? Um, so that was something I kind of got to work with through, uh, work with him through over the last five years. Um, so that, so visually that's a major influence. Um, otherwise, I, I suppose, um, Kiki, uh, Kiki Smith is another artist that I look at a lot. Uh, she does a lot of work in printmaking, um, but specifically her uh, work, her feminist work with uh, self-portraiture and portraits. Um, so I'm thinking a lot through that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what my other influences are. I look at a lot of women artists who work with their body. I like I'm trying to think of names, but I think that there's a there's a canon of that, right? Of feminist women's artwork um, and, and trying to reclaim the use of our body um, within art. So a lot of that is, is what I'm doing. Um, and then I look at a lot of performance artists. Um, yeah, because there's, I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling to think of names of artists, but, um, okay. but yeah, working through a lot of performance work because even though I end up work, making the work as a, as a 2D object on paper, there's all this prep work that happens before the images where it's me, props, camera, and what can I do with those things, right? And so I think a lot of performance artists do that. They're kind of just, how do I play with this object? Um, and what does that mean? So that's a lot of what I look at too. Yeah, I hope that kind of answer, answers it. <laughs> it does, yes, thank you. <laughs> all right, so, um... So I usually kind of end with, a, so what's next and the direction you're going? I know you're kind of in a thing that you're pushing further. So you have like an, another year, year and a half of grad school and you have any plans yet? Or is it still, a little, it's a little far out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd like to think I have plans, but I had plans three months ago and like this is what grad school does, right? Like you think you have an idea and then it's like, just kidding. Now you have a lot of questions and not a lot of plans. So I'm in a, I'm in a question state. Um, good. But good. yeah, it's a good, it's a great thing. It's great. Um, yeah. So I mean, definitely continuing to develop the work that is on show at Buckham right now. Um, I have a few prints in the works uh, that I'm coming up with next semester that'll continue to deal with these piles. Um, the work is kind of taking two directions. One is within these imagined landscapes, like the fences and the boat. And then the other direction is kind of going back into domestic spaces. Um, and I'm still figuring out how those two works are gonna bridge, uh, but I think they're both conceptually working with the same ideas. Um, and that work, I will have a, a in-progress exhibition uh, opening up at the, uh, Brooklyn Waterfront Artists Coalition in Brooklyn, New York uh, in July of 2022. Um, so these works that are at Buckham will be there, but also hopefully work that I'll develop in the next six months. Um, and then, yeah, I think what fall 2023-ish will be um, the end of my master's thesis. So there'll be another exhibition at that point. Um, I'll probably apply to show at Buckham again at that point <laughs> so we can awesome. know what, what's happened since then. Um, but yeah, so I'm just, I'm really just working on, on developing this, this new works of wood. I'm doing a little bit of film work, a little bit of um, uh, stop motion with the print. So things are branching out a little bit from woodcut, uh, even though I'm still very much based in, in that zone. Um, yeah, I think that's what's coming up. Yeah, oh, that's a lot of fun. And then very exciting. Oh, thank you so much for sharing all of this with, uh, well, not just me, but our Greater Flint audience and our online um, audience. So it's been really wonderful, you know, getting to know you a little better and, and your work. <laughs> thank you, it's been super fun.
Thanks for having me. I'm glad we got a chance to talk. And the exhibition at Buckham, you did a beautiful job hanging it. So thank you for, for just doing sure. that. And um, it was a great opening. So I just, you know, want to share, share my appreciation for Buckham and you guys do great things. So. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Emily. That was really a great conversation. And how fun to learn about uh, more, more about one of our artist collaborators. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the conversation. Thanks.